found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be
mysteriously we have hope. As parents, grandparents, spiritual leaders, teachers, mentors, and friends, the Lord anoint us to give them an overwhelming sense of security that can only come from you. Thank you. 
15 today. Luke chapter 15. Picking up where we left off last Sunday. Luke chapter 15. With a focus on the family uh, today, as we are in Luke chapter 15, we examined nine life lessons last week from the prodigal son or the wasteful son, and we, we saw where he listened to one of Satan's shortcuts and he journeyed into a far country and he wasted his money on wild living with harlots. And then a famine came and he was lacking and starving while slave to sin. And he came to himself and he returned home to his father. And his compassionate father saw him coming and the Bible says his father ran to him and fell on him and kissed him. And the father called for a celebration saying, my son was lost but is now found. And this reminds me of a funny story I heard about something else uh, that was lost. The carpet layer had come into a lady's home and had placed some carpet and he stepped down for a smoke. He, he smoked cigarettes only to realize that he had lost his cigarettes. And in the middle of the room, as he started to look, he saw that there was a hump in that carpet. And he was thinking, you know, no need in pulling all this carpet up just for that pack of cigarettes. So he proceeded to take a hammer and he started smashing it and flattening it out there. And a little while later, as he was cleaning up, uh, the, the lady uh, came, the lady who owned the home, she came in and, and she said, here, uh, here's your pack of cigarettes. I found them in the hallway. And now, she said, if only I could find my parakeet. Oh. <laughs> Remember, the father in our story had two sons. He had two sons. The younger son was the prodigal son uh, that we talked about last week in the message entitled The Journey to a Far Country. This week, we turn our attention to the elder son. The elder son with a message entitled In the Field. In the Field. And uh, before we read our text, I want you to be sure of something this morning. There is sin in the far country, but there is also sin in the field. In the field. So if the message last week did not pertain to you, then the message this week will pertain to you. See, God doesn't leave any of us out because we've all either have been or are in the far country or either we are or have been in the field. And so the question today is not whether we sin or did not sin or do not sin, but the question is, am I the sinner in the far country or the sinner in the field? And we're going to discover the difference today. And by the way, as we read and as we go through the message, sometimes I'll refer to the uh, brothers as younger brother or younger son or older brother or, or older son, but I'm talking about the same two people. When I say older, it's the older brother or younger or the younger brother or younger son, just so that you know I'm referring to the same people during that. Luke chapter 15, beginning with verse 25, is where we'll read. Now his elder son was in the field. And I especially call your attention to that. In the field. And as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called on the servants and asked what these things meant. And he, that is the servant, said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he, that is this brother, he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering and said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, that is the father said unto his older son, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make me and be glad. For this thy brother was dead, and is alive again, and was lost, and is found. Would you bow in prayer with me, please? Father in heaven, we ask for your anointing. We ask for your feet. Lord, I pray 
that you would speak to me and through me. Lord, as we prepared this message, I saw myself so much in this. And so, Lord, when we stand behind this sacred desk, Lord, we preach to ourselves more than anyone else. So, Lord, I pray this morning that you would use your word to speak to some folks here today. Lord, we just ask again that you would bless your word as it goes out. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll kind of set the stage for just a moment just so that we understand. And I'm going to come down here just so we can get the picture in our mind for these first few verses. I'm going to go through the back and pretend that I'm the elder son that was in the field. And we're going to pretend that this is the house for just a few moments. And, and you're going to hear the song, Go Happy Day, come on in just a few minutes if any of you are familiar uh, with that song because it was a happy day for this family. That father is happy. His younger, rebellious son has come home that has been gone uh, for so long. And it's a happy day. His son that was lost is now found. And, and so there's music and dancing. And I tried to get Jason Davis to dance, but this being a Baptist church, we decided to make it And uh, even Steve offered to do that. But uh, So I want you to picture in your mind, this is the house, and there's a celebration going on. And I'll be the older son in the field that year. Of religion, but not in the house 
of salvation. He was unaware of his father's business and what was going on in the house. The elder son was in the field of his father. He was working diligently. He was looking after the responsibilities of the field. Well, today, our churches in this year are filled with those who are just like this elder son. They work at religious things. They come to church often every week. They say prayers. They're able to engage in a little religious talk. They're even part of the service, but they have a problem. They're devoted to service, but they completely miss the Father's heart. They miss His heart. They come to church, but they think the scriptures and the messages that are taught and preached are for everyone else. For everyone else. Something else about this son. He was in the field, not in the house of his father. So he didn't know what was going on in the house of salvation or the house of repentance. He only knew what was going on in the field of religion. So when he looked at the celebration of the repentant sinners, he questioned it. He didn't understand it. He had to ask what it meant. What is this all about? You see, it's the same today. Those in the field of religion, and I get disgusted sometimes when I see the media interview some of these deans of religious studies and so forth at various universities who know nothing about salvation. They only know about the field of religion. They're dead spiritually. When someone is saying the church should celebrate, oh, happy day that it is. Heaven rejoices, and so should we. However, many sit in the pews, and whenever someone does come up and they receive Christ as their Savior, and we ask that you come and give them the right hand of fellowship, many don't do that. Why do they not do that? Because they don't understand what the celebration is about. Because they're not saved themselves. They're like the self-righteous elder son. I wonder this morning about you. Are you in the field of religion thinking you're doing something for the Father by sitting on the pews, singing a few songs, or today are you near to the heart of God? Do you hear the messages and think, oh, so-and-so really needed to hear that one today? Or are you thinking, oh, God, thank you for that message. I needed that today. Father, help us to see the coldness of our own hearts. This elder brother is self-righteous. How do I know that? Let's read on. The servant tells the son in verse 27, Your brother has come home, and your father is cooking steaks for everybody. Everybody's getting a steak tonight. I mentioned earlier, it's odd that this brother wasn't at the celebration. Why had no one told him that his brother was home? Or, or why wasn't he there? Had his father not told him? I believe there was some tension there. I believe that. I believe it's very likely that this son suddenly had more responsibility placed on him when his goofball younger brother runs off and squanders everything he has in the far country. All the pressure, all the stress, all the workload of running this family farm is now on this older brother and, and he's mad about it. Perhaps the older son had a temper, too, as we'll see in just a moment. No one really wanted to tell. But now, the younger son, his brother is back home. After perhaps years of separation, you would expect a positive reaction from the older brother. Instead, the news leads to an expression of jealousy and anger and power. Notice verse 28 says, He was angry and would not go in. And he's uh, pouting on the porch, so to speak, sitting there, and he would not, he refuses to go in. He's bitter. He had rather not have fellowship with his father than to accept his father's acceptance of his sinful brother. Ding, 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 ding. Does that sound familiar to the church? The Pharisees treated Jesus the same way when He accepted sinners, didn't they? But God loves all people, and so should we. And so the people in the house are having a great time, but not this man. Not this man. He's miserable. Because he feels, he's sitting there, he feels that he's been treated unfairly. He sits there angry, and he's miserable. He's miserable. The man's repentant brother has returned home. He's angry about it. He's bitter. Instead of rejoicing with everyone else, he's pouting. 
And I want to take a side road for just a moment. It's not really a side road, but it may seem that way. You see, you and I like to think that our sins aren't as bad as someone else's. And this older brother was pointing to his younger brother's sins and naming them off, as we'll see in just a few minutes. But understand that although the younger brother had lots of sins, so did this elder or older brother. The older brother, to everyone else, may have seemed like he had it all together. He was working hard in the field. He was productive. What a great son he is. He's not a sinner like his younger brother, is he? Think again. The younger brother's sins were visible. Yes, they were. His was on the outside. But his older brother, his sin is raging on the inside. And that's a very dangerous sin to have. That kind of sin is very dangerous. And I want us to understand what bitterness does to us and why it is so dangerous. It robs you of your joy. While those who you are bitter at, they're out of joy. Like those inside the house, they're enjoying life. But this man over here who's bitter, he's not very happy. He's not very happy. He could have been a huge blessing to his younger brother by coming in and hugging him and embracing him and saying, Welcome home, my brother. Instead, he's throwing away the opportunity by power sitting over there. Also see what bitterness does and making us stubborn and how it creates barriers in fellowship with God and with other people. And I tell you, when your relationship with the Lord is not right, then your relationship with fellow man will not be right either because it's this bitterness separates you from others. This boy did not want to go into the house and celebrate with his father and his brother and the rest of the family and the friends and the servants. He wanted to sit there and be miserable and bitter. Understand something else. It's easy. It's very easy for you and me to get bitter in life. It is. When something happens to us, when we think it's not fair, it's easy for us to get bitter. But you best be prepared for those consequences. You will not be close to the Lord and you will not be close to others when you are angry or bitter. I promise you. There will be no closeness with your spouse. There will be no closeness with your kids. There will be no closeness with your parents. And as long as you hold on to that bitterness, that's the way it will be. This is a key reason why many marriages fall apart. One or both partners are bitter about something. And when you're bitter, it affects your relationship in your home. It affects relationships in your workplace. It affects relationships with your church family. Often these people drop out of church or they quit coming or they cause problems in the church. So, if we were to be honest with the Lord and with ourselves today, we have to admit that we become bitter from time to time about things in life. So if you're bitter, if you feel as though something has happened to you that was not fair, talk to the Father about it. Talk to the Father about it. Won't you do that? Quit sitting on the porch, having, missing out on the blessings in the house of your Father. Quit missing out on those blessings that God has for you. Your life will not be right as long as you're sitting on the outside. I promise you. It won't be right. You do all you want to do and it will not. You're right. You'll just tear every relationship that you have apart with everybody around you. On this baby child dedication day, Cody and TJ, I want you all notice the action of the father here in verse 28. He had compassion on the rebellious son last week, and now he has equal compassion on this elder son. The father left the park, and he came out to his son to comfort him. And this Father, of course, is a picture of our Heavenly Father who is there to comfort us in our time of need. Now, I mentioned earlier that this elder brother was self-righteous, or he was in the field. How do we know this? You say, Jeffrey, you're passing judgment. How do you know that? Well, verses 29 through 30 make it clear to us as we see three marks of self-righteousness. Examine yourselves to see if this is a description of you this morning. All of us here at some point have probably stood in this older brother's shoes. We felt bitter. We felt like we were treated unfairly. Whether someone got a promotion at work, something happened within our family, something happened at church, whatever it might be, all of us have felt like we weren't treated right. Well, here are three marks of self-righteousness. First, we declare something unfair. In verse 29, verse 29, this older brother says to his father, you never gave me a goat. You never gave me a goat. 
This son is hurt from being ignored or forgotten and telling his father, you never did all this for me. You never threw a party for me. You never did this. This is unfair. For us, instead of a goat, we might feel cheated or deprived at work. Maybe somebody got special treatment or favoritism above us. Maybe our efforts of faithfulness have been ignored or, or we think that we've just been done playing wrong and we become frustrated and angry. This is a mark. But self-centered attitude, a sign of crushed pride or a wounded ego, focusing on self. Secondly, another mark of self-righteousness is self-praise. Self-praise. Verse 29, the son also wants to remind his father. He says, many years do I serve thee. Many years do I serve thee. He wants to brag on himself a little bit. A person who is self-righteous is full of self-praise. The son is thinking, here's what the son is thinking. I have contributed so much to the stinking family farm. But he wasn't thinking about how much he personally had benefited from being in his father's presence and this relationship with his father. If it wasn't for his father, there'd be no phone. And how his father had helped him, what he had learned probably with skills and so forth from his father through the years that his father had taught him. He didn't think about any of that. He was only focused on what he did. You see, self-righteous and prideful people never think about what others have sacrificed to help them. They only think about what they have done. This son certainly wasn't thankful for his father at this point. Shakespeare said, How sharp than a serpent's tooth is a thankless child. Another and final mark of self-righteousness is found in verse 30, and that's the blame game. The blame game. He says, This thy son was come. He does not call this other man his brother. He calls him his father's son. There's no gladness in his return. The elder brother views his brother as something vile. And his statement lacks love and respect for his father. And truly, the son blames his father and is saying, It's all your fault that I'm sitting here pouting. It's all your fault. You're the reason I feel this way. That's what this older brother is really saying to his father. The father had not done anything to pay. The only thing his father had done was welcome his son home, have compassion on him, and then come out to this older brother who's out there pouting. That's all the father had done. He had done nothing wrong. He had. But see, self-righteous people blame someone else for their unhappiness and their problems. But the problem is on the inside of them. It's not someone else. It's not somewhere else. The problem is them. It's them. And I wonder this morning, is self-righteousness right a problem for you? Do you see some of this elder son in yourself this morning? You know our Lord Jesus Christ spoke of this sin of self-righteousness more than any other in the Gospels. You see, when you read through the Gospels, You'll find that when Christ dealt with adultery, when Christ dealt with drunkenness or demon possession, He could be tender and gracious. But when He faced the self-righteous Pharisees, His words burned and scorched when He spoke. These self-righteous Pharisees, you know, lurked around looking for some accusation that they could make against Jesus Christ. And when Jesus went to sup, was like this. You remember how the people were? Oh, He dies with sinners, they would always say. But I'm so glad this morning that Jesus dies with sinners. That means that He will die with you and me. Amen? Will. If He didn't die with sinners, then you and I would be in trouble today. On one occasion, He told those Pharisees, You owe your father the devil. So Jesus had compassion on sinners. But He was stern with the self-righteous. Those who thought that they didn't need the great physician. A proper relationship with the Father, you see, I'm almost through, is not just about obedience, following laws and rituals and this and that. That's, that's not all there is to a proper relationship with the Father. But a proper relationship includes joy in the Father's presence. See, Psalm 1611 says, In thy presence is fullness of joy. In God's presence, in the Father's presence, there is fullness of joy. 
of joy. Fullness of joy. And I'll say this. There are a lot of sorry Christians out there with frowns on their faces, thinking they're obedient, thinking they're following Christ, but we are to enjoy life, folks. Don't be sour. Don't be critical each and every day. The Christian walk is a joyful walk. Amen. It's a joyful walk. And I was picking, I think I wrote something on Facebook that today would be a joyless Sunday. I didn't mean as in that kind of joy, but my wife's joy uh, because she's in Miami on the mission trip. But be joyful. Enjoy life. Enjoy your walk with Christ. Don't consider every day a new burden that you have to bear. Enjoy life. Laugh. Back to our text. Verse 31. The father came out onto the porch where his angry son is and says, Son, you're always with me. And everything I have is your friend. And son used here by the father is an affectionate return. What beautiful symbolism here of our heavenly father. Enjoy your relationship with the heavenly father. He says, all that is mine is yours. Your heir with Christ. Now I want to summarize these last two messages by saying this this morning. We first had the younger son who journeyed into the far country. And then we had the older son who was in the feet. We have what we're calling the prodigal son, the elder son. And of course the prodigal represents the tax collectors, the sinners, the open sinners. The older son represents the Pharisees, the scribes. The younger son was guilty of gross things. The older son was guilty of a critical and unloving spirit that cried from the inside. The younger son was an open sinner. Everyone could see what he had done. This older son was a hidden sinner. He kept his sins hid, so we thought. But they do come out eventually. The younger son came out of the pig pen. The older son came out of the feet and off that porch. The younger son was an unrighteous son. The older son was a self righteous son. But I want you to know this morning that the message from the Father was the same. Come. 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 So as we prepare for the invitation, perhaps as you look at your life today, somewhere along the way, you walked through the wrong door. And you disobeyed God. And you're now out of God's will. And maybe you never intended to do that, but you did. But you did. The only way back into God's will is back through that same door again. Won't you come? Perhaps you're here. You're a Christian, but your Christian life hasn't been joyful. You haven't enjoyed it. You haven't enjoyed it. Like the older son, maybe you've been off track. Something's got you off track. Maybe you've been serving in the field of the Father, but you haven't been near to the heart of God. It's time to come down to the feast and renew your vows to Him. Whether you've been in the far country, whether you've been in the field, the door is open, the table is spread, and the Father is waiting for all who will come this morning. For all who will come. As always, as I said earlier, this word is for me as much as anyone else, but I'm sure there have been some things that I've said that you could apply your life is way bitter, self-righteous, angry, feel as though something that happened to you is not fair, but you come. The message is the same. Want a new life? Come. Ready for a change? Come. Perhaps a family this morning would come and just rededicate their home. This baby child dedication. They say, you know, our home hasn't been what it should be. But we want to rededicate our home this morning to live for the Lord. And I want you to know the Father will have compassion on you today. The younger brother was in the far country. The elder brother was in the field. Where are you this morning? Where are you today? If you'll take that first step, I promise you on the authority of God's Word that the Father will come and have compassion on you. If you'll take that first step today, won't you come to the Father? He is coming. Won't you come? You bow in prayer with me, please. Father in heaven, we realize that all of us here today are sinners. And so, Lord, walking down the aisle, kneeling at the altar, or grabbing the preacher by the hand doesn't make you any different than anyone else except that you recognize.
that's at your center and that we need you and that we love you and that if it wasn't for your grace that we wouldn't be here today. And so Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts this morning. If we've been like the rebellious son off in the far country committing gross sins, Lord, why do we come home today? Father, if we've been like the elder brother in the field, nearby the house, doing your work, but we haven't been near to the heart of the Father. And so, Lord, I pray this morning that you speak to our hearts, convict us, rule us, draw us, or perhaps someone's here that just hasn't been, been, been a gloomy Christian instead of a joyful Christian. Everything's been naked in their life, so they think. But Lord, help us to focus on you today and be joyful. It's your desire that we would live the abundant life. And so, Lord, there are many here, I'm sure, that need to talk to you about something. Lord, might they use these moments, this time of response, this time of invitation to respond in a way that would be pleasing to you. And Father, I know by the authority of your word that if they will take the first step and come, that you will come beside them and comfort them, no matter what they're facing today. Oh, Holy Spirit, we pray. Bless this time. In Jesus' name.